Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have Dorothy Hoskins presenting Stylish Structure, XML and InDesign. Dorothy is the author of the brand new O'Reilly book, XML and InDesign, and we're really excited, folks, to have her with us today to present this webcast for you all. I will turn the program over to Dorothy in just a moment, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Dorothy. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Dorothy, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for her and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you may need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweets, and folks, today our hashtag is XML. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, just post it in the group chat, and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Dorothy for her presentation. Hello, Dorothy. Hi, yes, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, we have the first slide coming up here. Let's make sure we get that live. Is, it, is that being shown correctly? We have the cover slide up right now. Okay, great, thank you very much. All right, so uh, I will go right to the next slide. This is about myself. Um, my background is extensive in graphic design, print production, XML, XSLT, interactive multimedia, and teaching. So I have quite a varied background, um, but my personal love is XML all the time. Um, it's uh, something I've been working with since uh, 1999, which makes me one of the old timers in this business. Uh, this is the third version of my book, which was published twice before in the shortcut version, available only as a PDF online. Uh, this is the obligatory XML terminology page. I'm hoping that everyone who is in this broadcast has some idea of what XML is. Um, it is a markup language, which is OS neutral and application neutral, which lets you define the hierarchy and the um, meaning of content. Um, the tags or elements that are used in it can be defined for very specific purposes um, according to whatever your content model is. Content models are oftentimes referred to as schemas or DTDs, which is a document type definition. These are rules that control how the XML is created. And then uh, the XSL, uh, Extensible Style Sheet Language, is a common uh, programming language used for formatting XML and producing a variety of different outputs. XSL FO is a special version of XSL which is used for generating PDFs. So I hope that uh, covers the basics and we don't need to worry too much about any more of the terminology for the rest of this uh, presentation. What we're going to talk about today are these different scenarios, uh, which are the um, publishing scenarios that I most commonly have run into in my work. Uh, the first one is importing XML content into InDesign uh, to create structure inside the InDesign file. The second one is creating unstructured content uh, in, as InDesign files. Uh, directly from XML. So this is generating InDesign files, uh, either 
a complete file or just a story directly from XML. The third is creating um, XML out of InDesign. And the fourth is the much desired round trip of bringing XML into InDesign and um, sending it back out. And what I'll have here are some sample screenshots for each of these scenarios. And uh, you'll see that the last one, the elusive round trip into and out of, I don't have uh, screenshots for that one. That's because this is um, difficult to demonstrate without uh, spending another hour just on this whole uh, aspect of it. And it's very um, customer specific, so I don't like to show my customers' work. Um, but I'm certainly willing to talk more about that when we get to that point of the presentation. Uh, back in 2007, uh, I presented at an Idealize XML conference on the uh, outside-in XML publishing concept. And this is um, just evidence of how long this has been a possibility with InDesign. Um, for the last six years, there have been features in InDesign uh, at various versions of um, CS4, 5, 5.5, and 6. The outside-in concept is a little unusual. Um, I use the term separated at birth because uh, that usually in uh, American slang means that siblings have been raised in different families, which seems to be the problem with XML development for publishers. Um, most of the uh, development that's done in XML is for web type of applications or database applications. And most of the publishing that is done has nothing to do with those kinds of content except for catalog publishers and other people who use databases for their content. But what we get into with uh, working with XML and InDesign is that the publishers don't know how to talk to the XML developers and the XML developers don't know how to talk to the publishers. The main problem is that XML developers don't really understand the aesthetic requirements of print publishing. And they tend to say, well, we can generate a PDF for you, isn't that good enough? And often the answer is no, the publisher actually would like to be able to go into each page and tweak the layout and play with the typography, and they can't do that if it's a generated PDF file. So that brings us to the next situation here, which is uh, we'll talk about how we import XML structure into InDesign. This is the first demonstration of this outside-in type, type of concept. So bringing XML content into InDesign uh, is a way to make advantage of the built-in XML features of InDesign. It lets the writers write, um, and I will say that with a quote mark because most writers today don't actually usually write XML content themselves. Um, but it, nonetheless, the writing function can be separated from the designing function, and then a code type person can help bring these two worlds together inside InDesign. So you create the XML with XML tools, and you can validate it, and then you import it. Uh, and it, that keeps the content in XML free from presentation and keeps it from being in a, any kind of a proprietary format. It also means that you're going to use the publishing tool for what it does best, which is making your content look really nice. Um, this is where InDesign shines, as anybody who uses InDesign can attest. Um, and then you can also use uh, InCopy with InDesign if you're set up to do that. So you could have multiple writers contributing content for a single InDesign layout. So this process, excuse me, I should on here, um, has um, a fairly straightforward flow. You create the XML. You then have to set up an InDesign template that has styles which are mapped to your XML content. Bring your in, your in your XML, 
and you can um, do additional processing on it while it's being imported with uh, XSLT. Um, and you can also use some built-in features of InDesign to help you with um, matching up your styles. Then you can, after you've got it in InDesign, uh, tweak your layout as you want to and create your offset printable files. And then you can export those files again to uh, PDF or EPUB with the usual InDesign tools. And you can also export it again as XML and you can use XSLT when you are exporting it. A couple of the refinements that you can use in this process is to um, make use of the AI, that should say AID, sorry, AID namespace <clears throat> to force formatting onto your XML uh, when it's brought into InDesign. And you can also create scripts to automate the layout and copy fitting of the XML. For instance, say you have a data sheet, which is a two-pager, and you have three different languages, and some of the languages overflow the amount of um, layout space that's available because of the uh, larger um, numbers of uh, characters in their words. You can adjust that with script after you've uh, brought the XML into InDesign. You can adjust each one of your layouts by running a script to change the uh, line spacing or the point size. So these are sort of the basic ideas of how you can work with this process. And we'll take a look at it in more detail now. So here we have a view of the structure came inside InDesign. You can see at the top left, this is the structure pane, which is expanded uh, out to show the elements in a sort of a tree structure there. You can see starting right near the capital A on the slide uh, with the yellow background, you can see that this has a book structure, and it has a preface, and then it has some other content in it. It's a little hard to read at this uh, size, perhaps. Then at the bottom uh, on the left is the tags palette, which shows what the names of the elements are that you can use in your file. These are by default arranged in alphabetical order, which can be kind of a problem when you have a, a large number of XML tags. In the center, you see the InDesign document itself. And you'll see some funny little square brackets um, in the content. Those don't print. Um, that's just a visual cue if you have tags turned on in the document that shows you where the boundaries of your uh, XML elements are in your text, which can be kind of helpful if you're trying to understand what you're working with in the layout view. And then on the Bottom right is the paragraph styles, um, which you would be mapping uh, character and paragraph styles to your XML elements. Next, this is the tool that we have for uh, showing the um, structure inside InDesign in a um, more close-up view. The tree view that we saw in the structure uh, view is very difficult to edit um, specific tags inside of. But if you uh, open up content that has been created as structure in InDesign in the story editor, you can see the tags around the text. And this will give you an idea of how you've actually applied those tags uh, in the content. Um, unfortunately, it can only show one text frame at a time in the story editor. So if you uh, drag different parts of XML content into different stories on your layout, you'll have to open each one individually in the story editor to see this view of each one. Setting up the InDesign template is the first step step that we need to do to get ready to uh, bring in the XML. Usually what you want to do is model each of the XML elements that you want to style. Um, then you create a InDesign style definition for that, whether it's a character style or a paragraph style. And then you save that as an InDesign template. 
And this is all fairly ordinary in design uh, process stuff, nothing unusual about that, except that you have to uh, apply tags to these things. So let's look at that process also. The uh, elements in here are now going to have to have a corresponding tag applied to them. So you select the text, and you can create tags um, from uh, the tag menu in InDesign to make your own ad hoc kind of XML tagging structure. So you can just select text, and in the tags panel, say new element, and give it a name, and it'll be applied to whatever you've got selected at the time. Uh, so you can go through here and create a tag that is named the same as your content that you are um, um, seeing in the document. Uh, but you'll see here, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that I have the top line um, selected there, and the tag says title, and the paragraph style says preface title. So this is because in some XML content models, they use the same uh, element name, but it can be styled in different ways depending on where it occurs in your XML hierarchy. So there's some tricks that you have to use to create different looks for titles in different contexts when you're working with XML and InDesign. Now we're going to import the XML. Um, there are a bunch of settings that you need to look at. Um, I have a table in the book which describes each one of these settings uh, with some detail about how they're used and which ones are used mostly um, for repetitive types of content like business cards and catalogs and which ones might be unnecessary if that's not the kind of content that you're using. So the settings that you would use depend on what kind of content you're actually going to import into the InDesign template. Notice on this, the bottom of this panel uh, that I show here says import tells tables as InDesign tables. And this is a very handy feature if you have uh, doc book content which already has CALS tables modeled in it, you can import them and InDesign will create an InDesign table from that content. Uh, it will not create HTML type tables, it will only create a CALS type of table. But this can be very useful because then you can actually edit that table that's generated in InDesign and then when you export it, you'll be able to export it again as a CALS table. So this is one of the few uh, kind of round-tripping things that um, Adobe bothered to include in their consideration for uh, creating XML and InDesign. Um, what you're seeing here is from InDesign CS 5.5. Um, people ask me sometimes, you know, didn't they improve things? Um, the short answer is they really haven't changed anything since CS 5, and they certainly didn't add any new features in InDesign CS 6. It's not too likely that they will make any significant changes in CS 7, but honestly I have no way of knowing because uh, Adobe doesn't talk about their product plans uh, in advance. Um, if you sign up for the beta for the next version of the software, you might have a chance to see what they are planning to do with uh, InDesign in the next version. But for now, uh, as far as I know, this is all we have to work with. Going on here, um, once we have this content brought in, you can see in the structure pane that the uh, stub content that I had before in my uh, content template uh, has now been replaced with the incoming XML. So it has real text now in there, um, paragraph text and subtitles and titles of various types. Um, this works pretty well. Um, it's hard to do with complex uh, content that has a lot of variability. So we just made a very simple kind of a um, 
example here. If you look at the part that's highlighted in the screenshot over on the uh, right side, you see some text that is black um, background with white. And you, if you look at it, that's actually in italics, but it should not have been. So when it was imported uh, from XML into InDesign, InDesign did not properly turn off the um, italicizing after it finished the little bit of text there that says doc book XSL style sheets, which should have been the only part that was italic. So it's not, not perfect. And you have to check what you get after you import it and see how your results are meeting your expectations. Um, if you have ambitions, um, making a complete doc book template would be a wonderful thing for the uh, world at large, but um, it will probably be a very long and arduous process to do that. Next we're going to go on to looking a little bit just at what it takes to do more advanced work with InDesign uh, once you've got to this point. You can script and you can write XSLT, and they have different functions. Um, usually the scripting is used to automate your copy flow, um, to create um, line spacing adjustments or um, point size adjustments if you have an overset condition, or sometimes you might want to use a more advanced script that will actually generate a way to push content out from um, and designed into wikis and blogs. One of my uh, colleagues has done that in the past. You can also control the import and export of the XML more finely if you use XSLT. Um, the transformations are fairly straightforward. We'll sh I'll show you some of that in a minute. Um, but one thing you should know is that this is already getting into an area where you're going to need some pretty specialized help. Um, sometimes your web developer, if you have one, will be very familiar with the general principles of, of scripting um, JavaScript, and they can learn enough about the XML and InDesign to be able to help you um, create this kind of a crossover um, between these different worlds. But sometimes your InDesign person will have a very uh, much harder time understanding the whole idea of structured content, XML, XSLT, those kinds of things, because they're not um, generally, your InDesign people are not usually um, developer type people. So you may need some new resources if you start working with um, this kind of uh, programming. So that's the nutshell of importing XML into InDesign. And now we'll take a look at the next scenario, which is generating XML content, uh, I'm sorry, generating InDesign content from XML. There are two formats that have been available uh, in InDesign for, um, I think it goes back to InDesign CS5. They introduced the more modern version of the archival or interchange format. It used to be called INX, uh, was the file interchange format, but they now call it IDML. And IDML is a complete description of an InDesign file, the fonts, the images, the swatches, the, the um, layout, the master pages, uh, all the text, every image, uh, everything in the InDesign file is described in an archival format, um, which is it's like a zip file. It has many little folders in it with subfolders, and each one of those have different parts of the content of the InDesign file. If you are working just in InCopy, there's another markup language for that called ICML, which only works at the story level. So it doesn't make whole page layouts. Uh, you can create either IDML or ICML files just by writing XML code. 
So if you have people who are very well versed in XML and they get the information about how the IDML or ICML uh, package is constructed, it's also actually possible to generate InDesign files without actually having the application available at all. And then that can be sent to somebody and they can open it in InDesign and it'll make a complete InDesign file or make a story or whatever you've uh, created there. Since this is such a big topic, I would highly recommend that you visit a uh, video that I put a link for here. This was uh, created by Heath Lynn in 2008, but I think the general principles are quite um, useful to understand and there's not uh, a lot different, I don't think, in the overall programming workflow that you would need for working with IDML and ICML. Just a moment, excuse me. So the tool set, um, you need to have the InDesign SDK, which you can get from Adobe. You have to sign uh, an agreement to download the software. Um, and then you have to have somebody study it and understand how InDesign works and what the scripting language can do. Um, you will need people who are experienced in writing Java. Um, and there are some people already in the LinkedIn group um, that I run, um, especially Pepo Benelli who helped me with a contribution for the book, and uh, Heath Lynn's um, IDML, IDML Lib website is also very useful. So finding somebody to work with you is possible, but you'll have to poke around uh, to find people who understand XML and InDesign. Once you have development, um, you are creating not XML structure in the InDesign file, but you're just actually generating the uh, InDesign content directly from XML. So a lot of times this is run from an InDesign server application to get a very complete automation workflow. Um, and once you've got that going, you may need other skills to uh, address the content once it's placed into uh, InDesign, as I mentioned before. The most common function of um, XML in automation uh, is catalog publishing. Uh, it could be anything from a college course catalog to a catalog for the armed services um, parts uh, for uh, an aircraft carrier, <laughs> who knows what it could be. But uh, when you have a catalog function, you normally are, have a lot of repetitive blocks of content and you have a pretty predictable structure. So this kind of content works really well for uh, generating entire page layouts um, from XML content. So if you had content that had um, been organized in XML by categories of um, different types of products and then each of those product categories had a series of products in it, and each of those products had its own images and text and pricing data. All of that can be automated to create complete layouts in IDML. And then when those IDML files are opened up in InDesign, um, the layouts can be tweaked a little bit if you want to adjust something. Uh, you just should be aware that if you regenerate the file, you'll lose any tweaks that you've made. So you have to kind of look at this as a one-way street. Uh, one of the nice things about doing this kind of content layout uh, with automation is that um, the next year you could just change your style definitions. You don't have to change uh, anything else and uh, generate the content again and have a completely different look for the next year's catalog, which is rather nice. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. Um, the 
edge case for this is if you're trying to make more narrative type of content like DocBook. Um, DocBook is a very deep and complex um, content model. Um, people can write uh, an incredible variety of content and still be valid uh, doc book. So it's far different from the regularity and predictability of catalog. So uh, Pepo and I just took a very small piece of content, and you can download this from the book site on O'Reilly.com. Um, you can see how we made the XML, the XSL, to uh, create the ICML, and then the InDesign template into which that's placed, and then how this uh, comes together uh, to format the ICML when you place it into the InDesign file. So I think that's uh, the, the process that is of interest to a lot of people who don't want to work with XML structure in their InDesign files, but they want to use their XML to generate um, some content that they can then play with inside InDesign. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. Um, a lot of people uh, may be familiar with DocBook, but in case you're not, I'll just uh, show you a little snippet here of it in the code view in the Oxygen XML editor. Um, anybody who creates this kind of content has to have a pretty deep knowledge of XML and specific understanding of the DocBook uh, content model, which is um, not a lightweight thing to acquire. It takes uh, quite a bit of time to understand how to do this kind of work in XML editor. So um, this is a specialized skill set. There is a limited ability to create styled Word files, and then there's a uh, open source transform that can convert those into simple doc book files. So that might be one route for some publishers um, to create some generic doc book um, that could then be used for a process like I'm showing here. Now we're looking at the um, author view of DocBook, and this is still in the Oxygen XML editor. Um, this just gives you an idea of one of the reasons why DocBook is used so widely. Um, you can see it in most XML editors in a built-in WYSIWYG view. So it shows you um, where the titles are and uh, where the con content is made into paragraphs and where there might be local italics applied. So this is a view that most writers like to look at when they're uh, creating content in an XML editor. It just helps them see things or at least review it before they uh, finalize their XML. Once we have this XML, then we're going to want to make it into the ICML. And this is where uh, I don't, I hate to actually show very much of this because it's uh, very difficult to read uh, in globs on the screen, but I did want to give you a little tiny bit of it so you can relate it to the slides I'll show you next. Um, the ICML code is very verbose. If you look at it here, it has a paragraph style range, and it's applying a style called preface title. And then inside that, it has a character style range, which has a style of no character style. And this is the default way that ICML is created. Um, every paragraph includes character style ranges that have no character style. And then if there happens to be a specific character style applied, then that breaks the flow of the character style range, creates a new character style range just for the new style, and then when that little piece of specially formatted text is finished, it goes back to the no character style. So obviously this is a lot of changing back and forth between paragraph styles and runs of character styles, and it could be pretty difficult for anybody to look at this code for any length of time, so nobody looks at this except developers. We'll move on from this ugly screen to something a little more pleasant, I hope. 
which is how it looks when you bring it into InDesign. So here we have two layouts created from the same uh, ICML file. Um, the one on the left you can see has a, a single column and the headings are all in black. And this is uh, just one set of definitions for the styles in the ICML file. And the second one on the right, you see that it is now a two-column layout, and the headings are green, and they're in a different font. So just by changing the style definitions of the file, you can make different looks. And by changing the flow of the ICML file in the layout, you can change uh, from one to two columns or whatever you need to um, do in your layout. And this is what most um, XML people don't understand about InDesign, because you could now take this whole layout and play with it once you've generated it with your stories in it with the pre-formatting. You can play around with it and make this layout look like anything you want to. And for XML developers, that's kind of mysterious because they're so accustomed to uh, generating a fixed file like uh, a PDF that you can't easily edit once you've generated the, the content. So this really, in, in a nutshell, is the whole reason why most people like to use XML and InDesign together. Um, if you take a look at this a little bit more, um, this is uh, kind of a strange aspect of this. By using the XML, and generating the ICML, which is a, a, the story that I laid into the layout, I did not generate any XML tags in the structure pane. I just want to make it clear. So unlike the first instance where I imported XML and it created structure in InDesign, in this case I am using XML to generate ICML and there is no structure in the uh, InDesign file make sure that's clear to everybody. So here's our third scenario. Um, in this case, maybe you've got XML that you would like to get out of your InDesign files. Perhaps you have spent a lot of time and effort developing some content and uh, then you need to get an XML version of that content perhaps for archival purposes, perhaps because you want to make it into some other kind of format um, and you want a clean starting point that doesn't have a lot of extra uh, code in it. So you're looking for something that's um, going to provide an output that's quite regular and predictable and that's where your XML will help you. So we'll look at that process step by step. In this case, we're starting from InDesign. So the first rule is you need consistency in your paragraph and character styling. The better you um, kind of uh, enforce using styles for very specific purposes in your InDesign file, the better chance you have of getting some good quality XML out of it. For instance, if you have bolded all of the names of your um, key terms in your content and you just made a style that's called bold, um, you would do better if you changed that style name to something that's more meaningful like term so that you know what kind of bolding content that is because you might have bold that you're using for a lot of different purposes in a document. So if you're using it for a very specific thing, it's better to give it a very specific name. Um, in InDesign, you open the tags palette then you select some text and you create a new tag and name it something that's meaningful like term. Then you can select um, whole paragraphs and tag them with uh, additional tags like definition. Um, you can select an entire block of content and 
tag it as a glossary. So you make these names according to what your content is and what you're trying to do with it. You can import a DTD into InDesign to use in creating your XML content, but there are a couple of severe limitations on this. First of all, you need to have the DTD as a single file, and a lot of DTDs, especially for more complex content models, are a collection of DTDs, int, and mod files, and it's hard to pull them all together into a single file, but that's definitely the way that InDesign works best. And you want to have that uh, DTD available uh, on computers in the environment where you're working. You don't want to refer to them by a public uh, identifier. Um, InDesign will ask you for a system location for the DTD. And then you want to use the simplest DTD that you can possibly uh, use for the content that you're trying to create. So for instance, with DocBook, you might want to subset DocBook down to a very simple amount of content that you're going to use for your DTD um, when you're working in InDesign. Because when you have a tags palette open and it has 200 tags in it that you have to scroll up and down, it becomes very uh, painful to, to use that um, in the InDesign environment. So let's take a look at the next uh, thing, which is how these tags and, and things can be utilized even further. Um, you can use a couple of built-in features of InDesign, which are very useful to um, help uh, not have to manually tag everything. Uh, one of them is the find and change um, uh, settings. When you set up a find change, you first select a paragraph or character style that you want to look for, like that one that we were just mentioning, if you had a character style named term, and then you can uh, search for it, and then in your find, there's an ability here to select an XML element to apply. So this is something most people have never looked at in InDesign. So on the Find Change um, menu, you can select, as you see here in this example, I've selected an XML element called Term that I'm going to apply for that uh, character, I'm sorry, an, an element named Term that I'm going to apply for the character style term when it's found in the XML. There is one real limitation with this. You do not want to accidentally run the same find and change operation repeatedly because you will wind up with uh, nested InDesign uh, markup. It will have a term um, tag around a term tag if you run it more than one time. Another very useful tool in uh, InDesign is uh, map styles to tags. This is on the tags palette menu. When you pull it out, there's a uh, choice there that says map styles to tags. And you can do a similar kind of thing. In this case, it's much more global. Um, you can uh, map many styles to many tags in a single pass here. Um, if you named your elements and your styles the same, you can click the button called Map by Name. And I say this mapping is not recommended for complex XML. Um, for example, in the case of the doc book, we had a title element that might occur at a chapter level, at a section level, in the preface, in the glossary. All of those are going to be um, elements named title. Uh, you could find yourself with some unintended consequences if you are trying to map multiple style names to the same tag. You have to be careful and try it out and see if it works or whether you get some rather unusual results. <laughs> um, I think it can be done, but I think you should try it um, before you depend on something like this. 
So these are just some built-in tools. Um, I won't spend any more time on it than this because I think this kind of gives you an idea of what is possible with the built-in tools. Um, and there are, certainly are benefits to using something that's already available in your application. Once you've got the basic tagging done, a lot of times you'll need to add more tags. Uh, for instance, uh, you can switch to the story view. And if you have created some higher level tags, you can select text and then apply the tag around the selection. For instance, you see where I have this text highlighted in black here. Um, that was a term and a definition. And I've wrapped the two of them together with another element called the loss term. So that kind of thing is more easily done in the story editor. You can do it in layout, but it's harder to see what you're doing. Um, sometimes when you're doing this kind of activity, uh, you get quite a lot of enrichment in your XML, and it still will not be a valid uh, XML file for your DTD if your DTD requires um, things like uh, specific attributes with specific values. Um, that kind of thing can't be done in the story editor view. So it can be difficult to get a completely valid XML structure inside of InDesign. This is why, in many cases, what I recommend is getting it kind of good enough and then creating a transform uh, to use when you're doing the export. We'll look at the export function first. Um, this is the built-in features. As you can see from the top there, um, I didn't check everything, but you can choose to view your XML. And if you choose um, um, IE, uh, you will actually get a pretty good view of your XML structure in the browser window. Export from selected element, that means if you don't want to export the entire XML in your structure view, you, you can uh, export just a little chunk of it if you wanted to see how part of it is coming out. Uh, this is where you can export untagged tables as CALS XML. So this is the one that I referred to earlier in the talk when I discussed the import and how you can map a CALS table to InDesign. This is the reverse process. Notice that it says export untagged tables. This means that if there's even a single um, part of your table that has an XML tag that's been applied in it, you will have to untag it if you want to export that content in the table as CALS XML. Uh, so it's powerful, but you have to be careful to get your uh, tables um, so that they're not tagged. I think the reason they do this is because there could be a conflict. So you had tagged some content inside your InDesign table, and it was a kind of element that wasn't permitted in a CALS table. Then when they went to create your XML export, there would be a conflict they wouldn't know how to resolve. So they only let you export an untagged table as CALS XML, but it's still useful if, if you're uh, trying to do something that needs a CALS table. Then the next selection here, remap, break, white space, and special characters. Um, I go into detail in the, about this in the book also. This has to do with some special characters that InDesign uses um, for anchors, for uh, markers, for um, column and page breaks and other things which are not recognized in your XML environment. So by checking this box, you can get uh, most of those removed from your uh, InDesign, I mean from your XML that you export from InDesign. The last uh, box here, the uh, Apply XSLT, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. That's where you can actually um, provide a transform as the uh, XML is being exported from InDesign. Uh, I'm not going to go over the images tag in detail, but in your InDesign file, 
there is a way to auto tag images. And if you auto tag images, they will automatically um, get a um, path name appended to them as an href. And that means that they will actually function in XML as um, a reference to an external file. So this is kind of a handy um, aspect of using auto tag. However, um, you, there's a special place in the InDesign file for setting the element name that you are going to use for your, your images. Uh, you'll want to investigate that because the default is capital I-M-A-G-E as the uh, element name that it's going to put onto any image. And most of the XML content models that I know of do not use an element um, named capital I-M-A-G-E for an image. So um, there is a place to reset that in the XML um, environment inside InDesign. So it will tag it with some other tag like um, I-M-G for HTML, for instance. But when you tag images, you then have the ability to export them um, in, in the XML. I want to make one more observation here, which is important. If you do not tag the images in InDesign, they will never be in your XML. So you have to do something to make it so that they're recognized as part of your XML export. For that matter, anything that you don't tag as XML, like running headers and footers or any of the other parts of your document that are not part of your, your real content stream, won't be exported in the XML. Once you have tagged images, you can choose to export either the original images or an optimized version of the original images, um, which it'll do for some file formats automatically from InDesign. Or you can create a formatted version of the images, which could be uh, JPEG, GIF, or PNG type formats uh, during the export. You can actually select to create all three types of images when you export your XML from InDesign. So that's kind of uh, a useful um, group of settings for creating XML. We'll go on a little bit further here and take a look at the next aspect of it. Um, oops, excuse me, just a moment. The XSLT uh, that you can use during export. Um, this is most commonly used because it's so hard to create and validate XML inside InDesign that you probably don't have the complete structure that you want for your final XML. So if you use XSLT, the transform can rename elements. It can reorganize the tree structure. Uh, it can add new wrapper elements. Uh, for instance, uh, if you needed to uh, insert um, an OL or a UL uh, element around a set of list items um, that wouldn't be in your source XML. Perhaps you can do it uh, during the export with your XSLT. And then you can further process that initially exported XML with more um, XSLT after that if you need to. So it, it can be the start of a chain that eventually arrives at your final type of XML that you want. When you uh, add the XML, it's pretty straightforward. That um, menu that I showed you a couple of slides ago, there's a place that says Use Style Sheet from XML. So you can um, have that style sheet link right in your XML file if you want to. Uh, that's inserted as a processing instruction in your XML uh, in the structure pane. Or you can select an external style sheet. Um, and you can uh, create more than one export from the same XML. For instance, you could have one XSLT that will help you get an HTML output, such as a, a table of uh, glossary items. 
and then you could export it again with another XSLT that would perhaps make you a set of doc book uh, glossary items. So this is what we did in a very simple sample here just to give you an idea of what is required in the XSLT transformation process in case you're not familiar with it. So at the top of the file on the left, you see it says it's an XML file, but it's a standalone file. At the top of the file on the right, you see that it's referring to the um, glossary uh, part of the doc book um, DTD. Then we have uh, a glossary item in each of those as the first uh, element in the XML tree. But on the left, the next element is called a gloss term. And on the right, docbook needs that to be named gloss entry. Then we have on the left a term element, which must be made into a gloss term element for docbook. And then we have a definition on the left, which must be made into not just a gloss def, but also requires an, that it has a para tag inside the gloss def to make it valid in the uh, doc book XML. So the transform has to accommodate these different parts of uh, organizing this uh, content so it's valid for doc book, if that's what our goal is. So in this next view here, you see this is the XML that was exported from InDesign. And as part of my transform, I made it so that it would resort in alphabetical order. So you can see the top uh, item in the left panel, which is the kind of content I had in InDesign, is the word affidavit. And the second one is F1 visa. And the third one is EduPay. And in the resulting XML glossary, these have been properly sorted so that EduPay occurs before the F1 visa. So this is the kind of thing that is uh, really useful to use um, XSLT for. You can do things like this with other programming languages, uh, I'll just mention. but. If you're going to use XML structure inside InDesign and you already have the ability to use an XSLT when you're exporting, I would exploit that uh, rather than trying to just export the raw XML and then use Perl or some other language on it that's not really as powerful for XML content. And finally, we get to our uh, the stage that most people would like to be in, this fourth process, the uh, round tripping. I have heard this so many times from people. It just uh, makes me wonder why Adobe has not been paying attention uh, to this rather urgent need in the publishing environment. Um, when you create content, um, many publishers would like to be able to bring that XML in and lay it out in InDesign. And then they want to edit it. And then they would like to export the edited content as valid XML. And it's almost uh, impossible, but not completely impossible, to do that in InDesign the way it's set up now. Uh, you need quite a bit of engineering support to do a round trip. Um, there are some actual applications in the marketplace at the high end that were created just for this kind of a purpose. Um, but typically those um, software packages and platforms are over $100,000 US. Um, so it's, it's not something that many publishers are uh, excited to try to get into. So if you're going to set this up on your own, you will need to decide on your content model. You will need some kind of validating XML uh, application so you can check the content that you're creating. 
you will want to have some kind of XSLT that will make the uh, XML into a more friendly format for InDesign, uh, which can either mean that you want to flatten the structure somewhat as you import it into InDesign, or you want to add some hard-coded styling with the AID namespace, or both. And then you also will want some XSLT to go back the other way, um, which is actually the hardest part of development. Um, when you take a complex XML and simplify it, it's called downcasting. And normally when you do that, you are removing some of the information that would be important to restoring the complete XML in a round trip. It's, this is why it's so difficult to do round tripping. The XSLT for making the InDesign friendly XML and the XSLT to create a valid output uh, from the InDesign XML have to be developed uh, together so that you know what you're flattening out, how you're going to keep track of what's going on in the XML in the InDesign, and then hopefully be able to restore the deeper content model with XSLT when you export it. So well, this is why I say this is an elusive round trip process. There's just a lot of engineering overhead that's required for this kind of a uh, workflow. And that's why you don't hear a lot of people crowing about how well they can uh, do this kind of work in InDesign. And the limitations, um, these are some things that you just have to keep in mind anytime you're working with XML and InDesign. Uh, as I mentioned, it really wants a, a single DTD um, locally available, meaning not using a public identifier. Unfortunately, it is not currently possible to use a schema file with InDesign. Um, this can be really perplexing to people who know a lot about XML because schemas have pretty much replaced DTDs for serious XML work in all kinds of um, content models. And um, the idea that you can't use a schema with InDesign seems kind of incomprehensible, but that's the state of technology right now for Adobe. Uh, secondly, um, it is hard to create good mappings uh, between the deep content structures and InDesign styles. You're almost uh, always going to need XSLT to take titles at different levels in your incoming content and map them to different paragraph styles in your um, InDesign file. That, that kind of thing is extremely common. And it's not easy to do unless you use XSLT and add the AID namespace um, with that process. Inside InDesign, the uh, structure pane does permit you to do XML editing, but it is very fragile. Um, one of the most frustrating things is you can accidentally tag something with the wrong tag. This is most common if you have a text flow and you accidentally click the edge of the text flow at, um, or have selected the edge of a text flow when you click an, a tag name, you could apply a tag name like P to an entire text flow that should have been a chapter. Um, and you might not realize it until you go to validate it and everything is invalid and you don't know what happened. Um, and it can be hard to find where you made a mistake. To top it all off, um, though InDesign includes a validation function, a lot of times the validation messages it creates are kind of unhelpful. For instance, one of the most common ones that it will generate is, this element is not valid in this location, delete element. Well, you hardly ever want to just delete something because it's not valid, but it's not going to tell you where that particular piece of content is supposed to be uh, valid or how to make it valid. So it's very tricky to work with the structure pane and do any kind of serious XML editing inside InDesign. I really do not recommend it. 
So um, that's bad news for a lot of people who want to do a real um, round trip because they're always saying, oh, once I got it laid out in InDesign, I want to be able to edit my XML and export it again. Well, this is why that round trip uh, also can be very difficult is you need to have people trained and have very rigorous quality control inside InDesign for the edits they make in XML if you're going to use the XML editing features. And then finally, um, it is expensive to create these kinds of workflows uh, because of the engineering overhead for writing the different kinds of um, code that you want to work with, whether you're doing ICML and IDML, whether you're doing XML import, or whether you're doing XML export, all of these require skills that you may not have in-house. And so you oftentimes also need to do cross-training. Uh, people who are working in InDesign may have to learn something about XML structure. Uh, developers who are used to working with XML for websites may have to learn about InDesign. So it's it's not um, just going to fall on your lap to find the resources that you want to do this work. And uh, so often, of course, you need to get somebody who is more expert at this, and you will find some of those people in LinkedIn. If you start looking around, you will find some new people who can uh, help you with these kinds of processes. It's always worth uh, looking, uh, not just in LinkedIn, but other places. But I happen to know that uh, in my LinkedIn group, there are some people who do this kind of work as a living. Um, and uh, anybody who is listening who does do IDML, ICML, or uh, XML structure, XSLP, if you send um, a note uh, or a posting, rather, to the LinkedIn site, which uh, the address will be on one of the last slides here. If you send it to the LinkedIn site, uh, if I think it's an appropriate uh, posting, I will put it in the promotions area. Likewise, if you are a publisher and you're looking for somebody, uh, if I think it's an appropriate posting, I will put it in the job section of that LinkedIn uh, site. So hopefully we can connect up people who have needs with people who have skills. And then uh, one final note here, because it does come up, um, the InDesign server. Um, this is going to be part of the cost equation if you want to do heavy-duty automation. It's extremely productive. Um, the last I knew it cost at least $35,000 USD to get an InDesign server. Um, and then there's additional development costs to set it up to do whatever you're trying to do. However, it does make it possible to do template-based publishing. Um, so if you have a lot of content that needs to be handled uh, very consistently, uh, create templates and push the content directly into those templates with the server. The server is what they call headless, so you don't have to open the InDesign application to run it. You just uh, set up your process flow and it generates the output files for you and then you can open those up and check them in InDesign. Most of the time, this is a one-way flow. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of somebody offering a complete round-trip uh, server-based uh, workflow. And generally, if you um, use a server to generate content, whether you're putting XML structure into InDesign or you're generating IDML or ICML, whatever you're doing there, it's considered kind of a a push type of process. You just generate the content and then you use whatever you've generated. If you regenerate uh, the content, then you will override any adjustments you've made um, in the files. So you have to think of this as not being something you want to um, do repeatedly. Uh, you want to get your content that you're going to um, produce as final as possible run the process on the server to generate the InDesign, and then work with the InDesign from that point forward and not think about regenerating the whole file again with your server. All right, so um, I am going to 
uh, wrap up and take questions. Um, I can be reached, as you see on this slide here, um, there's the LinkedIn uh, website. There's also a special Gmail address that I set up just for correspondence with anybody from this site. And then I'm just going to show you briefly, if anybody wants it here, there is a example XSLT here for people who like to look at it a little more closely and aren't familiar with XSLT, you can uh, go back uh, to this slide and compare it with what I was talking about with making the glossary example for DocBook and you'll get a little better idea of how that happened. So I will turn it over now for questions. I hope everybody's been enjoying it. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for an outstanding webcast today. And yes, we have several questions, as you can imagine, that have come in. Folks, we will take as many questions as we have time for, and we're going to start with Emily's question. Um, she asks, what is the main difference between using the InDesign server and using the SDK to transform the data for importing XML to IDML and exporting IDML to XML? Hello, Dorothy. All right, folks, I'm terribly sorry. It looks like we have lost Dorothy. She dropped off the call. Terribly sorry about that. Um, I see our time is going a little bit over, so what we're going to ask is you can all see Dorothy's email address that she set up specifically for this event right there on the screen, xmlindesign at gmail.com. Feel free to email her. You can email her your questions, any comments, and she has graciously agreed to, to handle that and to give you advice and answer your questions. So again, look at the screen. There's her email address. You can also get a copy of today's slides from your resource widget. It's the dark green file folder in your widget tray. So download that. You'll have access to her email address there. Folks, thank you so much for attending our event today. I'm sorry we lost Dorothy, but we do say a very big thank you to her for presenting a really outstanding webcast for us today. Lots and lots of great information here. I hope you all found it helpful and beneficial. We'd also like to let you know that we have a special on Dorothy's book as a thank you for attending the event today. You can get her book today, XML and InDesign, at a really, really great price. So please open that group chat. If you didn't do it, you'll find the discount code there, and it'll save you some money and get you some good information. Folks, that will conclude our webcast today. Goodbye, everybody.